Awesome. Well, welcome. Thank you all so much for joining today. My name Thanks. is Lauren Pino, and I am the Program Manager for Community Education here at Cancer Pathways, and I will be the host of today's webinar. Uh, we are very excited about today's webinar because, as we all know, vaping continues to be a pressing issue for schools and communities, especially as it pertains to the impacts that it's having on youth and teens. The good news is, is that we truly can all play a role in creating an anti-vaping school culture, which is really the focus of today's webinar. Before we jump in, just a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, please feel free to use the chat box throughout the webinar for any questions that you have. Um, we do ask that you save any verbal questions for the end as we do have a dedicated Q&A session. Um, please also stay muted throughout the webinar up until that Q&A portion. We will be putting an evaluation survey in the chat box at the end of the meeting, and we do ask that all attendees please complete the evaluation. This evaluation survey is mandatory if you are requesting clock hours for attending the webinar today. All right, so just in case you haven't heard of Cancer Pathways before, I wanted to just give you a quick word about our, our organization. Since 1996, Cancer Pathways, formerly Gildas Club Seattle, has been dedicated to ensuring that no one faces cancer alone by offering support and educational programs in our community. One of those educational programs is Cancer Happens, which is our school-based program that offers a comprehensive curriculum for K through 12 in a variety of formats. We have been working with youth in school since 2005 and have actually reached over 125,000 students from across the country. In the past few years, we've greatly expanded our tobacco education, intervention, and cessation programs to really meet the growing demand and need for these services. Um, as we know, tobacco use is a big cancer risk factor, making this issue really near and dear to our mission. All right, so here's a quick overview of what our presenters will be covering today. Uh, first, data and the latest trends, um, vaping dangers and the risk to youth, the role that the school community can play, supportive tiered approach, how to communicate and intervene, and then countering the big tobacco message. We'll also provide a few resources and then um, one of our presenters, Jana, today will be sending out a packet of resources for you guys, likely tomorrow. So just a bit about today's presenters, Jana Master Giovanni uh, will be presenting first, and she is the program manager for Cancer Pathways school-based educational program, Cancer Happens. Matthew Cox will also be presenting today, and he works with the Prevent Coalition at ESD 112 in Vancouver, Washington. Just a bit more about Jana. So Jana is a licensed therapist whose specialty is working with individuals and families coping with a life-threatening disease. She has over a decade of experience working in the cancer field and participating in projects related to health and chronic disease. She began her work at Cancer Pathways as a group facilitator in 2013, but now primarily oversees the development and implementation of the Cancer Happens Teen Education Program. She has trained with the National Cancer Institute and American Lung Association to become a trained tobacco cessation and prevention specialist. She loves her current work and in participating in innovative programs that will impact generations of health across the nation. I am now going to turn it over to Jana. Awesome. Jana, you should yeah. be spotlighted now. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you for the, the introduction and thank you all for joining. Um, we're really looking forward to the webinar today. We should have a great mix of people. Um, I know we had educators, register, school administrators, intervention specialists, and, and even more. So please feel free to take a minute and introduce yourself in our chat box and, and maybe what your role is with the school system. It might be nice for everybody to kind of see that. Um, so as Lauren said, you know, vaping has become such a huge concern in the schools and for all of us. And, you know, that's why we're here today. It's going to take all of us working together. It's going to take us figuring out what our roles are within the school in order to create this culture that is supportive and that addresses the needs of all of our students. Um, I did want to start with this quote. I really appreciate this quote. I thought it would be a nice um, start today. Um, I know it seems overwhelming. 
in the schools sometimes, but I just want to encourage everybody to keep trying and, you know, know that you're making a difference and we're, you know, we're all in this together. So I'm looking forward to some good conversations today with everybody in the chat box. And then like Lauren mentioned, we will have a, a dedicated Q and A at the end. Um, some of you may have seen this video. I really enjoy this video. Um, I, I think it really provides a, a great example of a, a student and, and teacher interaction. So I'm going to let Lauren cue this up for us. Oh, we can't hear it, Lauren. I'm on it. It should be playing now. There you go. Oh no. Is that a vape? Hey, I see some of your friends are vaping nicotine, and now you're vaping. And I noticed that you're not really as focused in class anymore. Wouldn't you be happier if you just don't vape and maybe take up bird watching? Uh, okay, not the most persuasive argument, especially coming from someone he sees only 50 minutes a day. Forget that. He can do this. He probably already knows that vaping nicotine is bad for him. Just needs that extra nudge to quit from someone he trusts. Am I that someone? Yeah, I am that someone. I know you have a lot on your plate right now. Getting addicted to nicotine is the last thing you need. There are healthy ways to deal with stress. Maybe I can help you sign up for a photography class with your friends. Being creative is a great way to cope with stress. Is there anything else that we can do? Yeah, let's talk about it. Step up for your students. Talk to them about vaping. Visit cdc.gov vaping for more information. Okay. I, yeah. Like I really love that video. I think it highlights, you know, an opportunity for us to intervene. Um, there are many ways that school staff can get involved in addressing student vaping. Um, but sometimes those that are in the hallway, like this teacher, you're going to likely have a lot of opportunities to have these single moments with students or these conversations that, you know, really can make a big difference. Um, and again, you know, we understand teacher schools are, are overwhelmed. Um, there are a lot of competing priorities. Um, we want you to, to know that you're not alone. Um, and we hear this from all the schools that we're presenting in. And that's why we're here today. You know, how can we all work together? How can we share our resources? And some of you may already know this, but there are a lot of um, vaping programs available and curriculums and resources, and many of them are free. Um, and like Lauren mentioned, we're, we certainly have put that together for you guys um, that I'll be sharing with you tomorrow. Um, just an overview and, and more in-depth information on, on what we touch on today. So, you know, today I hope that you guys all feel leaving, you know, a little more confident in your approach with students and are more aware uh, of all the resources available. So to the polling question that you guys have already read, probably um, just curious if you want to write in the chat box, you know, what are you seeing right now as being, you know, one of the biggest barriers to reducing student vaping at your school? I'd love for you guys to take a minute and just throw that in the chat box. I already see a lot of introductions. Thank you for all the intros. Yeah, we can have some more come in. And Lauren, if you want to go ahead and move to the next slide, um, people can keep, keep putting stuff in the, the chat box if they like. Um, you know, before we touch on, you know, what some of these strategies are, you know, want to do a brief overview, um, you know, what vapes are, what some of the latest trends are, and, and some of the new data from the, the National Youth Tobacco Survey. Um, you know, on the screen here, just wanted to give an overview. You know, we all, probably all know what a vape product is at this point, but some sort of electronic device, electronic cigarette that is heating up a liquid solution, often referred to as an e-liquid or an e-juice, and then it's going to produce that aerosol that's being inhaled by the user. Um, and, you know, now you're starting to hear more often, you know, even used in the verb form and the verb tense, you know, vaping, juuling. 
Um, you can see some pictures of some examples of, of jewels or not jewels, vape products overall. Um, as you know, there are many, many different kinds, many, many different brands. Um, it, it's sometimes hard to, to keep up with. Next slide. I um, want to talk a little bit about some of the latest trends that we're seeing in the classroom. And this is something I would definitely love to see in the chat box. This is where I think we can kind of lean on each other and keep each other, you know, up to date and help keep each other prepared for, you know, new vape products that are coming onto the market. Some of the ones that I highlighted here, um, you know, one of them being the highlighter. I don't know if you guys have seen this in the classroom, but it functions as a highlighter and it's also a vaping device. Um, and then these vaping products here on the right-hand side that kind of look like Slurpees, um, you know, these really personally bother me because I have young children and they've seen my slides of this presentation and they were automatically drawn to the color and just their curiosity, you know, was raised immediately. So we can see how the, the marketing industry is definitely tar targeting younger people. Um, and, and then one of the new things that we're we're starting to hear more and more about with the vaping industry is their new goal to develop these sustainable products. Um, they want their products to be um, seen as environmentally friendly, um, recyclable. Uh, it looks like we have a misspelling on the slide. Sorry about that. And reusable. Um, you know, as you you've probably heard, and we're starting to hear this, you know, more in the classroom. Um, there's a group of, of students that are starting to push back and maybe reduce their vape use or quitting their vape use because they, you know, hearing more and more about the the disposal of the vapes and what the, the that is doing to our environment. So now we have the vaping industry that is starting to, you know, target that population. And what can we come up with now? Um, you know, the vaping industry and the tobacco industry definitely doesn't want to lose customers. Next slide. Um, so this is, you may have seen this, this is the, the latest um, from the National Youth Tobacco Survey. Um, so we have e-cigarettes. Um, we're the most popular product for the 10th year in a row. I cannot believe it's been 10 years already. Um, and then another uh, statistic that we, we pulled out was um, the amount of students that reported their use in the last 30 days. You're seeing 10% of students. <laughs> Um, one thing I want to highlight here, you know, that 10%, that number, I think you can look at this in, in two different ways. So 10% of these students, that's 2 million students. That, that's a lot of students that need, you know, our support and services. And I think the other way that you can use this number is if 10% are using, that means that 90% of youth are not using. And sometimes I don't think it feels like that to our students or even our, our school community as a whole. It feels like everybody's vaping or using these products. But in reality, um, it really is a smaller percentage. So we want to highlight that, you know, that's definitely an intervention strategy that I think we can use with our students. Um, next slide, some of the health consequences, some of the risks that come along with, with vaping. This is something we talk about in the students with the classroom and the question that they all want to ask us being Cancer Pathways, a, a cancer prevention um, organization. Uh, they want to know if e cigs cause cancer. Um, so we know that, or, you know, we don't know all of the, the long-term health effects, um, but we do know, you know, there's growing evidence and there's research um, about more and more the, the health risk and the harms that are associated with vaping. You know, we do know that it is harmful to two of our very vital organs, you know, our lungs and, and the brain. We do know that, you know, inhaling harmful chemicals into our lungs can cause lung damage. It can cause disease. We do know that there are cancer causing chemicals in these products, you know, formaldehyde, acetone. These are all, these are known carcinogens. Um, and, and then, you know, the damage that uh, can potentially be done to the brain. We do know that nicotine can harm, a, especially a developing adolescent brain. We know that nicotine is going to harm the part of the brain that's going to impact uh, attention and learning. So, you know, we're definitely going to see this and how this might impact um, student academic performance. And then what's really in these vapes? Uh, I think this is definitely something very important that we need to be sharing, you know, with our students. 
Um, you can see in the picture, the cancer causing chemicals, the ultra fine particles and the heavy metals that's going to cause lung damage and the nicotine, you know, that's the addictive substance. That's what keeps people coming back. The nicotine levels, as you probably know, you know, are higher in vape products, uh, and this is going to lead to addiction quicker. And then, you know, one thing that I, I don't think a lot of the students know in the classroom that we are talking to, um, I think it's common knowledge that secondhand smoke is harmful to those that are around it, but I don't think it's common knowledge that secondhand exposure to, you know, aerosol coming from the e-cigarettes the e and the vape products is also harmful. So we wanna make sure we relay that information too. So, what about the, the impact, you know, on our mental health, um, addiction possibility and, and the mood? Um, so nicotine, addiction, um, how this impacts our brain. This also includes our, our mood. Um, you can see that I think it's common that teenagers and even adults, you know, believe that vaping is a way that they can calm their nerves or reduce their stress. We hear this a lot in the classroom. We hear this a lot in our adult quit tobacco workshops. Um, many teams believe that nicotine is helping, you know, reduce their stress level. However, if you take a look at the cycle, you know, on the slide, it's the, the smoking and the vaping, yeah, might be relieving, you know, these nicotine withdrawal symptoms, um, this dependency that, that, that has developed on a particular substance like nicotine in this case, this relief is only, you know, temporary. The anxiety and the nerves are going to return, you know, when the nicotine lives, leaves the system and then the cycle just continues. And likely this anxiety is just going to worsen over time. So, you know, we know that using nicotine to manage stress is only going to worsen these symptoms of stress. Um, I don't know if you've ever been around people that have, you know, dealt with addictions or dependence on a substance, but it can be very consuming, very stressful, and all that that one can think about. Um, I think something else that comes up here is teens are probably going to tell you that, you know, these nicotine products and, and the vapes actually do help relieve their stress. And in the moment, that might actually be true. Um, but they're also building dependence on the sub substance and they're, you know, you're starting the cycle and this can be a very frustrating cycle. Um, this only perpetuates the stress. Um, it's not really a long-term solution. So that would be one thing that, you know, would be addressed in cessation workshops, you know, some of the underlying reasons for that stress and helping them find, you know, healthier alternatives. So if we have a student that is dealing with an addiction, um, you might see uh, some of these symptoms play out in, in the classroom or in the school. Um, irritability, restlessness, feeling anxious um, or depressed, trouble sleeping, sleeping a lot, trouble, trouble concentrating and, and constantly thinking about the nicotine. So you can imagine how that might impact somebody in the classroom or during a school day. I think that is the next school question. Uh, I would love to hear from you guys. You know, what have you seen, you know, in the classroom, in a school, you know, how, how does a student's vape use interfere with their performance at school? I'm looking at the chat box. I'm gonna have to catch up with you guys. Um, yeah, any thoughts of, of what everybody's seeing in the schools, um, how this is interfering with their performance at school? You guys feel free to add that frequent trips to the bathroom. Yes. Skipping class. So attendance. Mm -hmm. I think these are things that we can talk to and we take back to our admin, you know, how, how we're seeing this and using this information to inform us and in developing our prevention programs at, at the school. So I think next slide, you know, what can we do as a school? Um, what is our role um, with the, the vaping among our youth? So according to the FDA, you know, they have a, a youth prevention plan and it has these three categories, access, marketing and education. Access, you know, is relating to, you know, the ease of access the, the students and the youth are, are have at convenience stores of purchasing these items online. Marketing is going to be, you know, 
looking into where they're receiving their messages, what the messages are, and all this exposure to advertisement. And then we have education. And this is, you know, definitely where we fit in. Um, so let's take a look about look at, you know, how this is going to fit. Um, so when we say education, um, it's not just students. We want to be educating our, our school staff, too. And we want to develop the, the supportive culture. And a few thoughts on this. Um, you know, I think there's been a, a shift in the mindset on how we're handling the vaping issues in the schools. You know, we're certainly trying to move away from a discipline and a punitive approach, not to say that we're, we're not going to hold students accountable and that we're not clear about, you know, what our school policies are. But we also want to supplement this with supportive services and additional options. You know, for instance, you know, if someone's school policy is an in-school suspension for a violation, uh, a tobacco violation, a vaping violation, you know, in addition to that suspension, you know, maybe they could complete an online course uh, about the dangers of vaping. Maybe they could write a research paper, do some research. And I've seen some schools where they'll take that and then they might reduce the amount of days that they're in suspension. So we're really trying to view this more as a, a health problem now and not a discipline problem. We also want to develop and identify sources that we can implement in our school. You know, what do we want to bring in? What can we train our staff to do? And then what do we need to contract out for? And then we want to support our staff. Staff. Um, we want to train our staff, uh, professional development opportunities. We don't want to necessarily overwhelm you. We don't want you guys to feel helpless or think this is a helpless because we don't want our students to think that, that. We want them to believe that they can make these changes. And then student learning, we're going to break that down over the next few slides. So what kind of opportunities can we offer our students? So I've started seeing this in a lot of schools, the, the structure of support. I've also seen this, you know, working in the addiction field and out in the community. You know, not all our students are the same. Not all of them have the same needs. Not all of them are using vapes the same. So we want to provide multiple layers of support and education. Some of these levels and tiers, you know, may overlap. For example, if we have a student that's already addicted, um, maybe they're not ready to quit, maybe they're not ready to address the issue. So we may want to start with an intervention program first. Um, so the, the first tier, we have prevention, education. Now, this is going to be relevant to all students. Um, you know, our goal here is to hopefully avoid use, um, ever picking up this product to begin with. And then we have intervention. You know, here, there, this is going to be more targeted education, more targeted strategies for the individuals. You know, why are you losing, using? Um, our goal here is to avoid addiction. Um, this is often used in, in lieu of punishment or maybe a staff member is expressing concern with a student. And then we have cessation. Um, this is for students who are actively seeking help to quit. You know, maybe they lack the tools to quit. Maybe they've tried. Maybe they've been unsuccessful and they need more support. So what this might look like at each stage. Um, next slide, Lauren. You know, what are what students might be saying, you know, the vapes don't have any nicotine or it's only water vaping. You know, that's saying these students are, are misinformed. They need to be educated. With the intervention phase, um, perhaps they're saying, you know, only vape on the weekends, only vape with my friends, I'm never going to get addicted. You know, there's some room there to intervene with these students. And then those that might be saying, you know, I've tried to quit, it's hard to stop, or even, you know, I hate feeling like I can't go anywhere without my vape. These are all things that someone that is addicted and that might be interested in, in a cessation workshop. Okay, so prevention, just what this might look like, you know, how you might see this implemented in the school system. You know, what's worked well with, with us is going into health education classrooms and providing guest speakers and or an online format. So the, our curriculum, it aligns with national health education standards. So it's not really an additional ask for, for teachers. Um, you know, the content fits into um, some of the standards that they're already required to teach. So you can do this in the classroom. You can do it assembly style with a larger audience, do a grade level, you can do it online. You can ed do education, provide education on the walls in the hallway with posters. The, the curriculum and education is just going to provide factual information, you know, what the harms are, the truth of what's really in the vapes, um, that, you know, adolescents can become, you know, addicted quicker and strategies of, of the tobacco industry. 
this percentage here, the 66 percentage, this comes from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA. And here it says, you know, 66% of students believe that it's just flavoring in the e-cigarette. So there again, you know, they're misinformed. We need to educate them, make sure they have the facts. This is a, a result from a vaping survey that we sent to our students. Um, and the question was, do you know how to tell if there's nicotine in a vaping product? You can see that over what roughly 75% of them, um, it's unclear, it's confusing, which is exactly you know what the tobacco industry wants. So again, here these students need to be educated, you know, not necessarily you know how to read the labels on a vaping product, um, but to know that these products are unregulated and that the, the marketing industry is intentionally, you know, not being clear. So intervention services, intervention programs, um, some of this curriculum, what might be included in the curriculum is more insight into why the use. This is more, you know, individual about that person, the consequences of their use, you know, strategies and alternatives um, to using. This can be as simple as a, a brief interaction with a school staff, kind of like the teacher you saw in the video. This could also be, you know, a class or a workshop. This could be, you know, internal or external services that you contract out for. And, you know, I know there's one program, the in-depth program through American Lung Association. Um, they have it um, put in place to be an alternative to school suspension. So I really like down here, you can see that it's in red, that we we need to intervene. Um, not everybody who is using needs to become addicted. I think there is space for us to intervene and kind of change that course of their use. The statistic, 80%, it's speaking to the chart that Lauren just, yeah, you can stay on that chart. Um, we asked them, you know, do you feel like your peers want to quit, but maybe lack the tools? So you see over here, 22% said yes. So those would probably be a good fit for cessation services. This other 58% plus 20% are, are really the 58, the maybe. Those are the ones that are ambivalent. Those are the ones that are uncertain. Those are the ones that we want to intervene. Those are the ones that we want to continue to talk to and, and move forward in that process of quitting. All right, a couple of prompts uh, on intervening. You know, we're really just trying to get them to pause and think about their use. Um, a lot of open-ended questions are great for this. Um, you know, what do you enjoy about vaping? Just different prompts to help kind of open that conversation up. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, what if these students aren't ready to make a change? And you guys, you know, have probably ran into that. Um, you, you may have already received, you know, students that are rolling your eyes or perhaps they're just uninterested or they're, they're in denial or they're just plain resistant. Um, you know, that's okay. And it's probably likely, you know, I think we can still hold them accountable. We can still maintain, you know, any school rules or policies, but we want to continue to encourage them. We want to continue to give them the facts. And we want to leave the door open, you know, for future conversations. Um, we want them to know that they can come talk to us when they're ready. Um, and we want to check back in with them. You know, don't forget about them. Um, they're not a lost cause. I like to say, you know, we're always just planting these seeds. Um, ambivalence is a good thing. When they stop and think, that's a good thing. So one step at a time. And we're really trying to work towards tipping them kind of into that um, idea of quitting um, long term. So this was a response from our student vaping survey. You know, we all want to know, you know, what's going to get their attention, what's going to make a difference, you know, how do we help see them, help them see, you know, the consequences of, of these choices. So, you know, we really, we asked the teens themselves, we asked the students, you know, what, what's going to catch, you know, your, your peers attention. And you can kind of see in this word cloud, some of the things that were, you know, repeated most often, um, you know, mood, the impact on your mood, the impact on lungs and brain, the environment, um, got a lot of responses and, and cost and money. So these are things that we can use as strategies to, to start the conversation. You know, if you have a student that's really into the environment, you can use this as an angle into a conversation. You know, hey, did you know what's going on with the disposal of the vape products and how that's starting to impact our environment? 
Um, so it, it's nice to know, it's important to know, you know, why they're using. And then last here we have is cessation. Um, this can be, again, internal. This can be something in-house at the school, or you can refer out to an outside organization. Um, again, we have a long list uh, of organizations. You can also look for some that are in your area that provide these services. This typically is going to require um, a trained specialist. Um, cessation services is often works best when it's voluntary and, and the students want to, to quit. Um, there are definitely specific challenges for, for adolescents, you know, one of them being um, the NRT or the nicotine replacement therapies. These are not approved for this age group. This is like the nicotine gum, the nicotine patch. These are things that help alleviate withdrawal symptoms. You know, Lauren and I see them being used frequently with the adults that are trying to quit alongside, you know, a counseling and a support program. Um, but this is not really an option for most teens. The, the statistic here, this is another example of an American Lung Association um, program. They're, they're not. Um, this is their cessation curriculum, and they have seen that 90% of the participants that went through it, um, you know, reduced or quit vaping altogether. So I think that's great. <laughs> So depending on your role with the students and in the school, um, you know, you, you might continue to work with those that are interested in quitting or, you know, debating on quitting. Um, these are just some good questions that you can use to kind of assess their readiness to quit. And then, you know, if they're ready to quit, you know, tell me about your previous quit attempts. Um, who's going to support you during your quit? Um, you know, when do you most often crave nicotine? So these are these are helpful Again, depending on what your role is with students, but most importantly, if you have a student, you know, expressing their desire to quit, we want to congratulate them. We want to help and connect them to the support that they need to, to follow through with that quit. And then we always want to follow up with them and show them that we care. Another polling question, um, you know, what challenges do you think you will have or do you have, you know, when talking to youth uh, about vaping? And we still have some ideas on strategies, you know, we know facts about the products and the, the harms and the consequences. And what does this look like, though, when you're actually talking to students? Um, I see somebody asked if we can get the slide deck. The answer to that is yes. Um, you can go to the next slide, Lauren. So real briefly, um, some tips uh, on communicating to students. You know, one of my favorite psychologists, his name is Carl Rogers. He's, you know, very person-centered, humanistic approach. He, a lot of the mo motivational interviewing and techniques that I've shared here, you know, evolved from his theories. Um, you know, students ultimately, you know, they want to feel like they've been heard and they want to feel supported and we want to align them with the resources that fits, you know, what they need. Um, some of the, the tips here, you know, being empathetic, you know, really listening um, and the best way to show that you're understanding and being empathetic is to listen. Self-efficacy. Um, we really want the students to believe that they can change. Change is, change is possible. We want to empower them. Rolling re resistance, you know, this is a this is a really a real skill that needs a lot of practice. I think I get a lot of practice with my my in my personal life with my young children, my fifth grade daughter especially. Um, this is, you know, we want to avoid becoming defensive or argumentative. Um, we want to figure out how we can roll with this resistance and roll with that conversation and where it's going. And then developing discrepancy. This is also a, a great tip, you know. Perhaps there's opportunities where you can gently point out um, or highlight maybe any incongruent statements that, you know, the student is making. And maybe they're saying, hey, I really care about being healthy and like, paying attention to their diet and their exercise routine. But yet they're, you know, they're vaping on the weekends. And so kind of gently, again, gently, you know, pointing out that incongruency. And the next slide, you know, how do we elicit this change? How do we motivate our students? Um, a lot of open-ended questions if you want to have a conversation. 
being inquisitive, you know, one thing that I love to do when we go in the classroom, you know, the first thing I do is ask them what they know, you know, tell me what you guys know and what you've heard about vapes um, and, and just see where that conversation goes. We also want to be affirming, you know, life is hard, life is stressful, you know, really affirming these statements and the feelings and everything that they're going through. Reflective listening, uh, you know, this requires us to pay attention, to listen to what they're saying, not interrupt them, refrain from giving them advice um, and sharing back to them what they've heard to make sure we have understood them. And then last but not least, summarizing, you want to kind of provide a recap of that conversation. Then you also want to talk about next steps and then you want to help them follow through with those next steps. We want to keep this train moving. Um, and then last slide for me, I just want to end it on at one of the quotes that we've received from the, the students on the survey. Um, I think this was in response to, you know, what can we do to help other teens? And their response was, you know, they've had it argued to them before, you know, what they need are alternatives to give them the same result, social acceptance, acceptance and a sensation of pleasure. When you talk down to them, it just makes them want to do it more. So I think there's some valuable nuggets there that we can all all take away. Um, I don't think it's always, you know, how to talk to students, but a lot of it is, you know, how to listen to students. I think they want us and they need us to listen and they want us to provide them with support and alternatives. And, you know, I kind of think that sums up, you know, what our role is in the school. All right, I'm going to pass it back to you, Lauren. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jana. And thank you to everyone for sharing such great resources in the chat box. We will be sure to integrate um, those into the resources that we send out in our follow-up email as well. So up next, we do have Matthew Cox. Matthew is a community prevention project specialist with the Prevent Coalition, a Department of Educational Service District 112 in Vancouver, Washington. For the past five years, he has delivered youth commercial tobacco prevention campaigns in Southwest Washington and is a contractor for the Youth Cannabis and Commercial Tobacco Prevention Program with Washington State Department of Health. Matthew is a K-12 certified health and physical education teacher with over 20 years experience working in education and direct service programs for youth and young adults. I am going to now turn it over to you, Matt. Thank you for the introduction, Lauren. I'm pleased to be here to collaborate with Answer Pathways and uh, to be able to speak to everyone today. Let's go on to the next slide and get started. Today I'm gonna to talk about tobacco industry messaging and ways to counter that messaging that and, and do it in a way that will promote anti-vaping culture on campus. Next slide, please. To begin with, I wanna talk about the tobacco industry and their tactics. The tobacco industry spends billions of dollars annually to market and attract the public to addictive products. It differs from state to state, but in Washington state, it is estimated the industry spends over 84 million a year on marketing. That is an intimidating amount, especially when the state of Washington only allocates 6.5 million per year, which is about eight, percent of what the tobacco industry is spending. Next slide. Whether it's a tobacco corporation or a mom and pop vape store, the goal is all the same. It's the same as any business to make money. New devices and e-liquids go onto the market daily without authorization from the CDC, putting the public at risk. The tobacco industry game has been the same for the last hundred years to lure people to use nicotine and hook a long-term customer. This is especially lucrative on youth. Statistics show that over 90% of lifelong cigarette smokers started before age 18. Vapes are one of the newest ways to addict kids and create the next generation of long, lifelong customers. Tobacco companies use marketing and adver advertising tactics to lure customers to their products they also know that certain populations of people smoke and vape at higher rates, like non-high school graduates, military veterans, people in rural areas, low-income Americans, and 
people with behavioral health disorders, and so on. They intentionally prey on these groups with targeted advertising. Next slide, please. The tobacco industry markets to kids in many ways. It could be the use of teenage looking models in their advertisements or using ads on social media that, that reach youth, such as this image in the middle from TikTok offering no ID check. Is that a message for someone 21 and over? They also market to kids in convenience stores like the picture on the right of vape devices placed down low next to the candy. Next slide, please. Many of the tobacco industry advertising tactics have not changed. Here we see blue brand e-cigarettes advertising to women using an ad just like the one they used nearly 100 years ago for Lucky Strike cigarettes. On the right is the blue version of the Marlboro Man. Next slide, please. Flavors are the primary reason youth are lured to try vaping. The tobacco industry uses colorful, colorful packaging, fun designs, cartoon characters, candy flavorings, familiar brand names, all to grab the attention of youth and pique their curiosity. Even a plain tobacco flavored vape is made to look enticing. Next slide, please. It's hard to believe that the tobacco industry would communicate so blatantly to the public that they are trying to lure youth to start vaping. Here you go. Take a look at the images here on this slide. These are not marketed to adults. The fact is that there are only 23, 23 e-cigarette products that are approved by the FDA and are legal to sell in the United States. They are all tobacco flavored. So logic would suggest that all the rest are being sold illegally. Next slide, please. Youth spend many hours per day on screens connected to the internet. They will eventually at some point be exposed to vaping product messages online. If they click one of those ads, the computer algor algorithms will send them more and more vaping content. If a youth also has friends who vape or a family member that uses tobacco products or lives in a neighborhood with a vape shop, the net result can be a bombardment of pro-vaping messages. To counter a flood of industry misinformation, um, go back to the previous slide, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> to counter a flood of tobacco industry misinformation, youth need to hear an equal amount of pro-health and vaping prevention messages accompanied with alternative choices. Delivering continual prevention information to every youth and every adult who interacts with youth can, can seem pretty hard to do when tobacco companies have a mountain of marketing money at their disposal and all the colorful packaging, of course. But somewhere around 80% of people do not use tobacco products. And that is a lot of potential advocates for prevention. Next slide, please. Youth are very receptive to positive messaging. For example, most youth are vape and tobacco free. This statement highlights a fact and a positive message. Many youth have a misperception that everybody does it, but the, date, but the data does not support that. When youth learn most of their peers do not vape, it can be an incentive for, for many not to vape. Next slide, please. Helping youth find alternatives to vaping and supporting their participation is a great way to counter tobacco industry messaging. The Find Your Good campaign is one way to do this. The campaign aims to provide healthy activities, helps to promote healthy activities and positive interactions between youth to help them recognize that there are other choices to using substances. It was created by the Teens for Tomorrow Youth Prevention Club in Vancouver, Washington, with the assistance from the Prevent Coalition at ESD 112. The messaging and the images come from actual middle and high school students who share their good and the healthy ways they cope and deal with stress that help them stay substance free. 
Next slide, please. Messages that promote health and safety resonate with youth. Just a few months ago, I surveyed 75 school-aged youth and asked them if they had to attend a vaping presentation, a vaping present prevention uh, presentation, what would they want to hear about? And by far, the top answer was effects on the body. Students care about protecting their health and are curious about how things they hear about will affect them. Just remind youth that they only get one brain and they can't buy another. The lungs are only designed for Earth's natural atmosphere. Challenge youth to avoid being fooled into putting unsafe substances into their body to impress their friends or to allow some company someplace to make a buck. Next slide, please. Having a team of prevention champions are the best tool in drowning out the tobacco industry messages and influence. School prevention clubs can be the most powerful vaping prevention advocate on campus. They can blanket every corner of the school campus with anti-vaping, pro-health messaging, promote healthy and fun activities as an alternative to vaping, and represent student voices on prevention initiatives and policy change. Student assisted professionals foster safe school environments. They provide and promote healthy youth development and prevent substance abuse. They can connect their school with prevention resources and synergize prevention efforts with youth and the community. Community coalitions work to bring all sectors of a community together, including schools, and do that to synergize youth prevention efforts and promote health and safety in the community. Together, these three entities create a powerful team of anti-vaping communications that can drown out tobacco industry messages and protect youth. Next slide, please. Vaping should be treated as a health issue and not a discipline issue. Who provides health care in a school Great. setting? School nurses, of course. School, nurse, school nurses are a prominent voice of health messaging in a school. They can be a great partner in promoting anti-vaping and pro-health messaging on a school campus. Make them a partner. Next slide, please. Another great way to counter the message, the tobacco industry message, is to, uh, and, and also to educate at the same time, is to implement one of the many turnkey vaping prevention curriculums available. Many are aligned with state learning standards, allowing them to be used in classrooms by teachers and in many different subjects. Stanford Toolkit, uh, Know the Truth by, Vape, by Truth Initiative, Catch My Breath, uh, the FDA's Vaping Prevention and Education Resource Center, um, Know the Risks by the Surgeon General. All these are examples. There are many, many more out there. Next slide, please. You can find all that curriculum and more vaping prevention resources on www.youthnow.me under the schools tab. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to give this back to Lauren to take us to the next step. Awesome, thank you so much, Matt. Um, I just wanna follow up all those amazing uh, resources when it comes to educating youth. Um, and just plug our Cancer Happens program. I'd be remiss if we didn't. We have great health educators that come into schools um, all around Washington, and we're able to do virtual presentations as well um, to cover curriculum when it comes to cancer risk reduction. And of course, we cover, um, we have a pretty significant section covering vaping. So I just want to thank both Jana and Matt for sharing such valuable and important information today. Um, despite youth vaping, you know, continuing to feel like a persistent and sometimes tiring issue. It's really empowering to know that we can all play a role in intervening and talking with youth and that there are really great resources available as well. Um, so we do have about 10 minutes left in our webinar today. I would like to open it up. Um, if you guys have any questions for Jana and Matt, um, you can feel free to enter those questions into the chat box um, or you can come off mute to ask your question. Can I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> I've already unmuted and started. 
I'm wondering if any of the folks, uh, the, the presenters or others in the room have a sense of how much THC uh, vaping is going on at our school. I think it's mostly tobacco, but I'm, I'm just curious, what's the percentage? I'm gonna mute THC abuse. Yeah, that was something um, we're seeing that I don't have a percentage off the top of my head. Maybe Matt does, but I'm definitely hearing more and more about it when we go present the schools. Students are asking about it more. Um, and I'm definitely I've heard from other schools that are starting to test what's in the vapes more often because they're seeing more marijuana, THC and other substances in the vapes. So I don't know if that's something you're starting to see, too. I would uh, on that, I agree. There's, um, I, I think they have a, a term for it, like um, the youth do, which is, um, I can't remember off the top of my head what it is, but it's when you combine THC with a um, a tobacco-based vape or nicotine-based vape. Um, and uh, it is something that is, I think there has been an increase in, in, that, uh, in that behavior. I would defer uh, if you're in Washington State. I'm not assuming everyone here is uh, to go to askhys.net for the Healthy Youth Survey data, which has just come out. I know that they captured some data around that, and probably you could do a quick um, sir, a, a quick uh, look into their data for that. Um, outside of that, um, connect with your local community co coalition. I'm sure that they're already capturing that information and they could get you some statistics as well. Yeah, I think that, that the treatment for that is going to look a little bit different too, right, than nicotine cessation. So you're going to want to align and find a resource. Um, it's a psychoactive substance, right? It's going to have additional challenges that are going to need to be addressed and supported during their quit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a few other people are echoing what you said, Caitlin, that vaping THC is a huge problem in their school. Um, the Healthy Youth Survey does, also has data on cannabis use, um, and then they break out the forms of cannabis being used into a data dashboard that is super helpful. Thank you, Margaret. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any questions? Great question. Yeah. I was going to throw something out because I was just going over the Healthy Youth Survey today with my groups. And I'm up in Skagit County, mm -hmm. and I was amazed that um, in the Healthy Youth Survey, they had um, reported substance vaped among current 30-day vape products, um, and this was 10th grade, and it was 68% um, wow. out of the 1,096, and our, um, tobacco or nicotine was 78%. So that blew me away that that was so much cannabis. Um, I didn't realize it was that much. Thank you for that, Steve. I have a question. Um, it talks about vaping, but when I looked up some of the curriculum, it never talked about the vape itself and how that heats up and adds to whatever they're smoking, where can I get that addressed? You mean more of the, the harms of the heating process? Yes, and the plastic and all that's added in with the actual vape. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good information like FDA, the CDC, you know, they break down, you know, every potential harm of, of vapes and e-cigarette products. Um, I think that's one of the resources we have listed in the packet um, that just provides general information about vape products and all of the potential harms. That is something I, we cover in our uh, Cancer Happens program, too, is the heating of that coil and how that leaks those heavy toxic metals into the e-liquid. Um, so yeah, like Janice said, we'll definitely follow up with all that information for you. We used to get a lot of questions in the classroom about, um, vaping products exploding, mm -hmm. um, for, for a while. I haven't heard as much about that lately though. I think this is where you, um, you kind of know your audience, right? I think, you know, your students, I think, you know, what's going to grab their attention. And, and so for you, you, you know, that might be something, um, that you want to use in your classroom with your students.
Any other questions? If you guys have questions, I'll keep monitoring the chat box. I'm going to throw a link to our evaluation survey into the chat box. Um, we very much appreciate your feedback, um, what you thought of the webinar today. Um, for those who attended, uh, if you'd like to receive that one clock hour for attendance, then uh, we do ask that you definitely complete this evaluation survey. Um, and then, like I said to throughout the webinar, be on the lookout for a packet of resources in your email to supplement what was presented today. Um, thank you all so much again for attending, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you, everybody.